Amen. Well, welcome in the mighty name of Jesus. Friends, know that you are so loved, you are prayed for, and you belong here. We're starting a brand new sermon series today titled Axioms. And today we're going to be talking about the importance of friends, the importance of community, the importance of the people around you. And so what a joy it is this morning to be gathered as friends, gathered as community with the shared purpose of worshiping our great God. And so we'll worship this morning by hearing God's word be proclaimed in the scriptures and in the songs. We'll then respond by coming to the Lord's table for communion. Then finally, at the very end of this service, we'll be sent forth back out into the world on mission to help others follow Jesus. At this time, though, I would like to encourage each of us to check in. And so here's how you'll check in this morning. You'll simply grab your cell phone. You'll go to the camera app on your cell phone. and You'll scan the QR code on the pew in front of you. To all of our friends who are worshiping online right now, you'll simply follow the link that was just shared in the comment section, and you'll be able to check in that way. Also, if this is your first time here at Asbury today, we want to say welcome. We're honored that you're here. Uh, Again, we're talking about friendship today, and I believe that here at Asbury, you'll find such great, great friends. Uh, But here at Asbury, our mission is helping others follow Jesus. And again, if this is your first time here at Asbury, uh, we would love for you to participate with us in that mission. And so whenever you check in today as a first-time guest, second-time guest, or third-time guest, uh, we'll donate $10 toward an organization helping Ukraine uh, on your behalf. Just a small, practical way for us to live into our mission of helping others follow Jesus. Uh, Well, friends, as we continue on in worship this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we love you, and you are the creator of the universe. You are perfect in all of your ways, and still you call us friend. You invite us to walk with you and talk with you. God, you invite us to fellowship with you. So thank you. We worship you this morning, and all this we pray in the mighty and powerful and strong name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Well, when we pray, we are preoccupied with our needs And when we praise and give thanks, we're preoccupied with our blessings. But when we worship, we are preoccupied with our almighty God. So let's stand and worship this morning. How great is our God. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. my king would die for me. 
king would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy. Would you join me in this historic confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Adam Hare. I'm the director of modern worship here at Asbury, so I don't get to come over to probably my favorite service here. I call it the casually reverent service, right? Anyway, so we're so happy to be with you. And this is one of our ser uh, seniors this year, Caroline Avey. She's graduating from Regent this year, and she's uh, going to sing a song called Gratitude while we watch our grad video.
Good morning, Asbury. My name is Ribbon Dorado. This is Samuel Greer, and we are your high school student ministry associates here at Asbury. It is truly an honor to be able to congratulate this group of seniors. When I think back to the first moment I met these seniors, I think of a group that was truly honorary. They were full of giggles and jokes, but ultimately a really fun time. We've shared a great amount of fun times together, but also a great amount of spiritual hard times together. Our seniors have poured countless hours into their spiritual life, whether that be through confirmation, baptism, retreats, camps, mission trips, serving, and much, much more. They have learned the importance of following Jesus, but they have also learned the vital importance of helping others follow Jesus. Their spiritual life has been truly admirable. As our seniors head off maybe to college or to work, wherever it may be, we as a student ministry staff leave them with these words from John 15, 5. And Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If I remain in you and you in me, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. May our students, may our seniors always remember the importance of staying connected to the true vine. May they always remain in Christ and may they bear fruit all the days of their life. We are so proud of these seniors. They have done an amazing, amazing job and their dedication is truly amazing. To add on to what Ruben said, we're also super grateful for all the parents and small group leaders and just the congregation as a whole who have poured into the lives of these students. Um, and we're really, we're very great, grateful to be able to serve such a wonderful church family. You guys are phenomenal and um, have really come alongside these seniors. In that way, the small group leaders have also come alongside the seniors and poured into them on a weekly basis for years on end, some of them for as long as the students have been in sixth and seventh grade. And we've seen that uh, the saying goes that it takes a village to raise a child, but we've noticed that it takes a church. Um, and so we're just very appreciative of the sacrifice and everything that they've put in to these students. And so in the effort and in the spirit of lifting up each other in prayer and in support and gratitude, let's pray together in the way that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holy, holy, holy. 
right, thank you so much. Good to be with you all today. We do begin a new sermon series on axioms, which is something that is a worthy saying. And so there are a lot of them, and you have axioms too, and it would might be a good idea for you to start writing them down. And I've, this has been a habit of mine for a number of years, and uh, I think I'm at about 225 of them. And uh, if you're interested, we'll make that available to you in uh, some sort of a, of a fashion. But take your Bibles. Uh, if you don't have yours, there are Pew Bibles. Turn to page 344. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 12. Let's set a little background, though, on this in that so King Solomon, David's son, does extraordinarily well. And in 1 Kings chapter 2, we're introduced to him after the death of his father. And then we see that he asked God for wisdom. And with that, a lot of times wise people become wealthy. Not always, but a lot of times they just know how to do things. And wisdom often leads to wealth. And we see with Solomon, not only wisdom and wealth, but we also see that he was a worshiper of God. And when the temple was built under his direction, we see that that he worshiped God. And it says that when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the tent of meetings, that there in the temple, that the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And it was one of the, the prayers of, of, of Solomon in 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 is a beautiful, beautiful prayer. And so we see this, this note of who this man is, a very godly man. Everything is going his, well, his way until you come to chapter 11. And chapter 11, a lot of times we did a sermon series called But, which is a transitional saying, but there's going to be, it's going this way and then it goes that way. And so in this one, it doesn't use the word but, it uses the word now. And you look in chapter 11, verse 1, and it says now. And it's like, uh-oh, we got a problem. Now, everything has gone so well for Solomon. But we're introduced and now King Solomon loved many foreign women. And then look in verse, uh, verse 3, it says, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they'll turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives and were who were princesses, and 300, as they said in the, the little kid in the, in the uh, Sunday school, 300 porcupines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So, today it's going to be a sermon on this one, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And this is going to be the first of five. Uh, the one right above this, uh, I'm not sure who it was that said this one, you hang around the barber shop, barber shop long enough, sooner or later you'll get a haircut. So if you, we become like the people that we hang out with, and this is true with Solomon. The wisest man ever hangs out with people that took his heart astray. Same thing happens to us as well. So, let's look. He's going to have a successor, and we're introduced to his successor, who is his son, Rehoboam, uh, who is not God's choice, by the way, but we see that there's going to be a transition. And so, with this transition that is going to be taking place, Rehoboam is a young man, and he's got He's going to be going from one place. He's inexperienced. He doesn't really know what he's doing. And this is going to be a major time of change. He's following his famous father, who people like the Queen of Sheba, probably from Ethiopia or Yemen, came to see him. I mean, this guy, everybody all over the world came and brought him gifts. And so now it's going to transition. And then things started going bad towards, he kind of, Solomon did a face plant there at the end. And so things were not going well. So there's going to be this transition and he's going to have to make a choice about who he's going to worship and how he's going to lead. And is he going to lead with humility and with wisdom or is he going to lead with arrogance and pride? And so we see the results of that. So we also see that there is another problem that 
his father had introduced what we call apostasy, that is turning from the faith. And Solomon started worshiping these other gods. And so there are, he's got 700 wives, 300 concubines. He's got a thousand influences. He's making these political arrangements. Things are not going to go well. <clears throat> Rehoboam has got to decide which way he's going to go. Is he going to worship God or is he going to worship the idols? So he's got a problem that he's got to solve. And third, we would say that he's got a problem with the people. So who is he going to listen to? Because the people are going to come to him and say, hey, buddy, you gotta, you're killing us. You know, the Israelites used to be in Egypt, and we had a Pharaoh, and he crushed us with, with heavy labor. What you're doing to us is kind of like what happened back in Egypt. You're kind of the, your dad was like a new Pharaoh, and he's crushing us, and you've got to relieve this burden, this taxation to pay for all of your dad's women and all of the stuff that he was consuming. We need a break. You can't do this any longer. So this is kind of the setup. Rehoboam's walking into this, and he's got a mess on his hands. Things are not going well in the kingdom. So we come to chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11 in response to to the reverence we have in our heart for God's Word, let's stand as we do our reading. Ready? Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, go away for three days, then come again to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever." But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you. You may be seated. And let's pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, the good news is Rehoboam, the king apparent, is asking for advice. And he has the two audiences. Now, this is not about age. This is about wisdom, about humility, about listening. So it's not that they're old or young, that's not the deal, it's about wisdom or foolishness. And so, so he goes and he listens to the wrong people. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. The friends that we have are the people that speak into our lives, they, they tell us things and, and we develop their habits and their attitudes and behaviors and their language and show me your friends, I'll show you how you're going to live your life. And this is what we want to say, the reason we're using this axiom today is because it's Grad Sunday. 
And this is that time in which young people are making decisions and choices that will make them, that will last for all of their lives. And so this is a very, very important time. Now, with these axioms, I, I have almost a story I can tell with every one of them. And so when it's show me your friends, I'll show you your future, I'll share with you the story that that really prompts this why it's so important to me because I learned it my freshman year in college. And you probably heard me talk about this, but I had a friend uh, in a class at ORU. His name was Jim. And Jim was one of the funniest, cleverest people I've ever been around. He was a really gifted cartoonist. And I would sit next to him in class in humanities. The auditorium held about 100 people at ORU, and I'd go in there and kind of anonymous, you know, and I'd sit at the back, and Jim would save me a seat, and he'd motion for me, and I'd go over, and I, I loved it. Humanities class I didn't pay any attention to, but Jim and I, he would draw these cartoons of the professor and the other students, and, you know, we would just like, you know, giggle, and, you know, I mean, it was that, that sort of a thing. It was so much fun. Then I took the midterm. I was failing, and I realized at that point I had a decision to make. Go and sit next to Jim and have fun and goof off, or shake my head no when he motioned to me, come and sit next to me because I've saved you a seat. Jim never finished college, and I wonder if I had gotten an F in that class and it led to other things, I probably would never have met my wife. I probably would not have finished college. I certainly would not have been ordained in the church. I would not be your pastor. You see, it's these little things, these little decisions. Am I going to sit next to this fun person and goof off? Or am I going to, oh, I hated humanities, by the way. Uh, Dana loved it. I hated it. It was awful. It's just, those old dead people, you know, I mean, come on, you know, classical music, you know, uh, come on, you know, give me music by the doors or something, you know, that was a time, you know, but anyway. This is a wonderful book. I, I told you in, my, in the sermon journal that I, this has been my favorite book this, this year, uh, You're Invited. Uh, it's not a Christian book, but it really has so many Christian principles to it. And so, the art and science of cultivating influence. And so, here's the, here's the quote here that's in the book. The fundamental element that defines the quality of our lives is the people we surround ourselves with and the conversations we have with them. So there is another, that is actually the quote from John Levy, the author of the book, but there is another name there. And so this is Jean, I guess it's pronounced Nidech. Let me tell you her story. So she had always had, growing up, she always had a problem with weight. She was always overweight. When she was 38 years old, she's 5'7", she weighed 214 pounds. She wore a size 44 muumuu, but she took the label out of it because she was embarrassed by that, and she put, just to help her feel better, size 20. When she would go to the supermarket, she would buy boxes of cookies, and she would apologize. She's embarrassed. She would tell the clerk that she's buying them for her children when, in fact, she would take the boxes of cookies, she would hide them in her bathroom, and she would devour all of these cookies. Uh, she was just out of control. And one time she was in the supermarket, and a friend came up to her and said, oh, Jean, you're looking great. And Jean smiled and kind of surprised and said, well, thank you. And then the friend said, when are you due? Thinking that she was pregnant. And that served as motivation. Jean said, I've got to get my life in order. And so she started trying to do things. She goes on all of these diets and tries all of this stuff. And what would happen is she'd lose a couple of pounds and then she'd gain, she'd go into binge eating once again and it just didn't work. Finally, she decided, you know, another axiom, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. She said, I've got to come up with a different kind of a system. So Jean invited six other women who were having similar problems with their weight. They came to her house, they sat down and they said, okay, we're gonna develop a new system. There's one rule that we've got to agree with and that is before we do this, we've all got to go to the doctor and get clearance from the doctor. So that was set up and so over the next year, Jean lost 70 pounds. 
and she kept the weight off for the next 53 years. And so word started getting out, and a community was developed, and hundreds of women started coming to her, and so she really got this thing organized and was really, really going with it. And, you know, if you're wise, you often become wealthy, and she became a multimillionaire, and she developed a system that has helped millions, tens of millions of people all around the world. And so when she died at the age of 91, Jean Nydetsch and her Weight Watchers International Organization had changed the lives of so many people. What happens is that, you see, it's so important that we surround ourselves with people who think with us. That's why we have the church. This is a wonderful picture here. Uh, You saw Adam just a moment ago. Uh, This is a a picture of his family, and so uh, here we see on uh, on the far side, uh, this is a baptismal service, and that's Rue. She's four. Last Sunday, that is his daughter, and Tasha is 12, and this is Gwen, and she is 18. We have a baptism, a confirmation and a graduation in Adam and Kate's family that's happening right now. Show me your friends. I'll show you how you're going to raise your family. And so what Adam and Kate have done is that they've made it very intentional commitment to be in church. And their children are going to be there. I would not be here had it not been for my mom and dad saying, we're going to church. I didn't like it. I disagreed with it. And there were times that I literally snuck out of Rose Hill Methodist Church. It wasn't that far to my home. I went home during the, I figured out how to do this. I could get home and watch the NFL highlights. This is before they had tape, you know, and all of that stuff and and, uh, ESPN, all that. And I could get out, get to my house and get back. And then we'd drive home and the parents would say, well, how do you like the service today? Oh, it was great. How do you think about the sermon? Oh, Jesus is wonderful. I wasn't there, you know, but that's kind of the way you do it. But my parents said, you're going. And when I protested, it didn't matter. I went. And this is something, if you're going to be a parent, be a parent. Lead your family. Don't say, oh, we'll sleep in. Because show me your friends. I'm going to show you your habits. And it's we are the culmination of our habits, those daily decisions that we make. So it's not only a problem in our culture. It's always been a problem. Because this is our bias is towards inertia, towards laziness, towards sloth. And so that's why it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, let us, let us stir up, let us, cons- let us consider how to stir up. So I'm thinking of two words as I memorize this verse, lettuce, thinking of lettuce, a head of lettuce, stir up, let us consider how to stir up. You know the sugar that you put in your tea? I don't do that, by the way, but, you know, you stir it up or it all goes to the bottom, you got to stir it up. Let us consider how to stir up. How can you stir up somebody? I mean, you can do it in a positive way. You can do it in a negative way. How can you stir up? Let us consider how to stir up one another to what? To love and to good works. And then look at this phrase. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. This needs to be our habit to gather together every single Sunday for worship. Show me your habits, I'll show you your future. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And so we see this over and over again. So John Ortberg, a pastor, was driving in his car, and he's using one of those GPS, you know, the global positioning satellite. And as he's driving along, uh, his wife is with him. Uh, getting instructions from his GPS. 
uh, the GPS says turn left. And well, he knows better, that's not the right way to go. So he turns right and immediately the voice comes. Recalculating your route when as soon as possible execute a U-turn. So it keeps on saying that as he keeps on going. So he does what a lot of men will do. He turns the thing off. And he gets lost as a goose. And his wife loves it immensely. So finally they turn it back on and you know what the voice says? You fool! I told you to go the other way and now you want me to help you to get back? over my dead body. No, it didn't say that. It says what? Recalculating the route when, as soon as possible, execute a U-turn. And that's what we have to do continually, execute the U-turn. You see, we have a GPS. If I can make it kind of corny here, maybe it's God's pos positioning service. And, and there are people and there's a word, the scriptures, that redirect and call us to repent and to turn and to go the other way. We hear that voice and we've got to go, we've got to turn, we've got to come back. And so this becomes our opportunity then to respond to the grace of Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's his grace, is that he doesn't come with us when we go the wrong way and blast us and condemn us. He just says, listen, where you are, whatever you're doing right now, if you're hearing this voice, just stop and turn around and don't worry about the past. Learn from the past, but don't let that blackmail you. Continue to turn around and to go in alliance, in accordance with God's Word. And when we do that, then we experience what is called grace. And that's what this is about because we all have issues. We all have struggles. We all have things that we're trying to reform. And so this is what we're, what we're trying to do. We're trying to live in a, in a different way, a fundamental element that defines the quality of our lives as the people we surround ourselves with. And I would say also that if we can, when I talk about show me your friends, I'll tell you another friend that I have is my books. And I'm reading all the time. You know why? Because I need other smart people with wisdom to give me their direction. And when it's only me watching TV, there's not much that's going to develop and grow. I need outside sources that are investing in me so that I can be the very best. So when I think about this, I would say that show me your friends, I'll show you your future is so true. And so we saw it with, with Solomon. We saw it with Rehoboam. So he listened to the young men because the young men had a vested interest. You understand that if they hang around and the king likes them, then he's going to keep, give them a job. They're going to have job security. So they're going to like suck up to the king. They're going to tell him what he wants to hear. But they're not going to tell him the truth. And they're inexperienced. And so he leans into the inexperience and the folly of people that really don't know what they're doing instead of listening to sane, reasoned, experienced voices. We need to be around people that will give us different insights and that we need to have wisdom to, to pick and, and to choose the right course. But we think of that, that's what, what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, when he said, don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And so we see this again and again. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Who are your friends? How do they influence you? And that's why we need, it's not that we don't have people that aren't Christians, but the people that we really listen to need to be people of faith. And we need to have God's word as the GPS of our lives and direct our lives around that. I would also say, show me your friend. Can we make it singular and not plural? Because in John 15, Jesus said, after I am the true vine and you're the branches, he also says, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. And what a wonderful note it is that Jesus calls us 
his friend. Show me your friend because this friend can do something for us that nobody else can do. He can forgive our sin. He can help us with his spirit to live within us. He can give us his body, the church. And when this life is over, he can take us into a glorious new kingdom. So this becomes our direction. Show me your friends, the people that we're surrounded with, and show me your friend, the one who is our Lord and Savior. And as we said, as we've gone through this this period of refurbishment and rebuilding, we're truly better together. I need you, you need me, we need each other. And as we do this together, there's harmony, there's peace, there's unity, there's growth. We listen to the right voices. And when we do that, we're able to serve Christ in a better and more wonderful way. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, God's word has been proclaimed in such a powerful way this morning. And so now this is our time, our opportunity to respond to that proclamation. You know, one of my favorite aspects of communion is how we don't come to the table alone. We come together as community, as family, as friends. And so I invite you as we go through the liturgy this morning, just to notice all of the communal corporate words. It's not God, I confess, I confess, I confess. It's God, we confess, we confess, and so on. So Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the greatest news of all time. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. And so in the mighty, glorious name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people here on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, God, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples. He gave it to his friends, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus then took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of their sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim this glorious mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. You know, we often say that this whole service comes down to this moment. This is the pinnacle of our worship service each Sunday morning. And you know, it's not just the pastor coming up here and praying this prayer. It's all of us as a church, as friends, as community uh, coming together. So let's pray these words out loud together. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here 
and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Friends, I just want to remind you that you are so deeply loved and that you are invited. You're invited to the communion table. Uh, so in a moment, you'll be released to come forward to the nearest communion station to you. Uh, there at that communion station, we've got wonderful volunteers, wonderful communion stewards. Uh, there they will have a, a small plastic disposable cup. They have a piece of bread for you. They'll dip it in the grape juice, place it in the cup, and then hand it to you. Uh, once you receive your cup with the bread and the juice in it, you're invited to return to your pews or come down to the prayer rails and uh, spend some time in prayer there. Myself and Pastor Tom will be behind the prayer rails if you'd like to uh, pray with the pastor this morning. Also, if you have your tithes and your gifts with you this morning, you're invited to bring those with you, and you can drop them off in the boxes at each communion station. Uh, but friends, again, you are loved, you are prayed for, you are invited, and the table has been set, and the invitation has gone forth. Come as you are. All are welcome. All are invited. There is 
our praise as we sing our doxology. Let me introduce to you two of my friends. This is Xander and Aaron, and you all are engaged, right? You get married in January, correct? So, you know, last Sunday we recognized all the marriages that were 50 years and above. So it will be 2073 whenever you all celebrate 50 <laughs> years of marriage. But, uh, but welcome. I just have a few very important questions to ask you. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins? 
All right, one more question. Will you be loyal to Jesus Christ as expressed through Asbury? And will you uphold these wonderful people, these wonderful friends, by five things? By your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. If so, say we will. Well, welcome, friends, to the Asbury family. A congregation, we have a response to make. Let's join together in these words. We, we rejoice, rejoice to recognize Christ. you as members of Christ's holy church and bid you welcome to Asbury. We view we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Amen. Welcome. Well, friends, it's been a great morning of worship. So this Thursday is National Day of Prayer, and we're doing a very special service on National Day of Prayer. It's going to be here in the chapel at 7 in the morning. It's kind of early, but the amazing Angie Cockrell will be leading worship for us. We're having the lieutenant governor actually come and share a little bit. We're just going to be praying for our state, praying for our nation, and afterwards, there was going to be breakfast burritos for a Cinco de Mayo as well, because it's also Thursday. So you're invited back to that. Again, that's this Thursday, uh, May 5th, uh, here in the, the chapel. Uh, but friends, now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Here I